Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name's Colin Greenlees. Um, quite an interesting opener from uh, Jason there. Uh, and I think you'll see, uh, as I begin to go through my presentation, that uh, how some of his techniques, if they're married up with my techniques, and it's, it's something uh, we've done in the past, um, how it could have a, sort of quite a negative impact on your organisation. So today, <coughs> excuse me, I want to be talking about social engineering. But not social engineering from a technical point of view, from the fishing uh, and everything else, but more through direct physical social interaction, i.e. face-to-face and uh, with, uh, through the telephone as well, which is, uh, you know, traditionally, um, you, know, you think back to the days of people like Kevin Mitnick and uh, some of the other um, more notorious social engineers. Uh, th these are some of the, the techniques that, that, they would, that they would have used. So I'm just trying to get this going. Yeah, so what you've got to do is ask yourself this question. So are you confident enough to say that your organization has not been breached through social engineering techniques? Uh, because the chances are that it's, uh, that it's already happened. Social engineering, as you're probably aware, has been around for, for many years. Uh, and to a certain extent, it has flown under the radar when it comes to the topic of uh, securing your data. But if you look at a lot of the global surveys, uh, particularly over the last few years, um, uh, and the ones that relate to uh, data or security data breaches, they will demonstrate that it's usually around sort of a quarter of all known breaches are due to social engineering. Um, and known is a, a very, very sort of uh, important word there. Because due to the very nature of social engineering attacks, it is very, very difficult to prepare any sort of meaningful uh, so statistical evidence uh, of the impact of uh, attacks on organizations because in most cases it will not be known um, if an attack has taken place and whether uh, an attacker has stolen uh, any information. Um, as I say, most of the attacks go unnoticed uh, and unreported. Now, during my career, uh, my security career, I've, you know, when I was consulting, one of my sort of specialist areas was social engineering. I've targeted over a thousand people. I was talking up uh, a few months ago when I was um, starting to get this presentation ready. And uh, I think I can count on one hand the amount of times it's either been reported to either a manager or to a service desk or uh, a help desk. So that gives you an idea. So, you know, when I, I spoke earlier about the number of known breaches that uh, are mentioned in, in those surveys, um, it's, that's why the, uh, the evidence is very, very difficult to, to put together. So social engineering, so what is it really? Well, in effect, it, uh, this is the, the, sort of, uh, the, the expression I've come up with, is really to manipulate someone into providing valuable or confidential information or access to that information using non-technical means. Um, uh, and the sign of a truly successful social engineer is that they receive information without raising any suspicion as to uh, what they're doing. And they are successful because they employ numerous tactics to, uh, to get to the goal. And these are, are just, uh, just some of the, the, the tactics. Now, one of the key areas on there is elicitation. Now, elicitation is basically used to get to know people better. And this is the, the way I usually worked. Some people, you know, when there are some social engineers, they, they like to use uh, influence or sometimes even coercion. But that leaves a lasting impression on the, on the, the target that, uh, you know, that, that you're trying to get the information from. And the simple process of, uh, of having a, a conversation and sharing information, getting to know somebody a bit better and asking well-placed questions um, the, the trick is not to, de to trigger any sort of defensive reaction in the, in the target. Um, you know, particularly if you do it in a sort of innocent and, and very casual manner. And it allows you to probe for information or build layers of information that lets you get to your target. For the, uh, the sort of IT people in here, think of it like port scanning. Um, you port scan a target machine for open ports uh, that will uh, respond to your scan. Once the, the social engineers, what ports or protocols are active, it allows him to focus efforts on that area, just as a hacker would 
when they're, uh, when they're scanning um, your, your ports. Social engineers also use uh, psychology and psychological triggers. And psychological triggers were something that I used to use quite a bit when I was doing uh, my social engineer attacks. So what do I mean by them? Well, let me give you an example. I was conducting an attack against an organization. And this was just against 25 people. It was part of a, a much larger attack. <clears throat> and I wanted to demonstrate that um, you know, even in the workplace, you're at risk from a personal perspective. And the, the intention was to try and gain as much information as I could that would um, allow me, if I was a malicious attacker, to steal somebody's identity. So what I was looking to get was name, address, date of birth. It's quite sort of basic information. Next of kin, details, including their addresses, all the telephone numbers, national insurance number, um, I was also uh, looking to um, get answers to security questions. So your mother's maiden name, and uh, say your first school, your first pet, all the usual sorts of things that you, you see, and also bank details. So how I went about this was I was phoning up people within the organization at random, just chatting to them, getting to know them, and I told them I was uh, working with the IT help desk um, and the HR database had been corrupted, and I needed to verify their details. I went through everything, and, you know, as I say, there were 25 people that were targeted. And I'll go back to the, the, psycho the psychological trigger, because uh, the only sticking point I got with a, just a few people, but not many, because, again, I, was, I used the elicitation technique, getting friendly, getting to know them. When I asked them for the bank details, that uh, a few people say, well, why do you need that? And my trigger for them was, well, we want to make sure you get paid. <clears throat> there you go. Out of the 25 people I targeted, 24 of them gave me every single piece of information that I asked for. The 25th offered to call me back with his bank details because he didn't have them to hand. Not one of these people reported this, um, and nothing ever happened. Now, as Jason said, I'm going to be giving some more war stories. Uh, now, the first one, um, you know, and this is, a, this is a, another example. Um, I had to target a, a government organization. Um, it was very similar to this one. I just pretended to um, be working for the help desk. And what I was doing was um, trying to get usernames and passwords. It was relatively simple. I did some sort of background information, finding out all about the help desk and the culture within the organization. Uh, you know, uh, I discovered that the, the internal help desk number was 7777 and the help desk had a specific name. Um, so I would call people up and I targeted 125 people on this, uh, this particular exercise. Uh, and I say this was a, a government organization. Now the reason they brought me in to uh, conduct this exercise was that they just completed an 18-month uh, awareness and education uh, campaign, and they wanted to demonstrate to senior management how effective it had been. Um, so they called me in, and I did the attack. Uh, and as I said, I was um, conducted this. Um, I told them I was, people from, I was from the uh, IT help desk. There was um, a problem with their email. I needed them to log off. And I then said, I just need your username and password. Once I'd done a couple, I, I knew what the, the username structure was. So I would say, well, your username is Smith D. I just need your password. I'm going to log on remotely as you and fix the problem. This is a very much condensed version. Each call would take about 15 minutes. You know, I'd chat to them, get to know them, find out what sort of problems they had. Um, cut a long story short. Uh, out of the 125 people, I had a 97% success rate. So 97% of people gave me their usernames and passwords. But what I was doing, I mean, I just had a, a fake, fake keyboard, or a, a redundant keyboard next to me, and I just pretended to be um, tapping in. Nobody reported it to the help desk out of those 125, and nobody reported it to, to management, which goes back to those, uh, those earlier things I, I was talking about. Interestingly, one of the, um, the people I called up um, when I spoke to her, she said, oh, yeah, I'm having problems with my keyboard, uh, with my email. Got her to log off. Got her to log back on. She said, oh, thank you very much. It's fixed. Oh, I it was the best thing since sliced bread. I hadn't been anywhere near their, their system. 
But the interest, one of the un interesting thing was um, every single one of those calls I made from home. I wasn't sitting internally. I was sitting in my house, in my office, uh, and that's how I made, uh, and that's where I made all the calls from. So that's uh, a little bit of food for thought, hopefully. So who are social engineers? Well, as you're no doubt aware, the threat landscape has changed so much over the last few years. Traditionally, we've always thought of, um, of hackers as being sort of pimply little kids in their bedrooms surrounded by dirty socks and pizza boxes. But as we all know, data theft is now big business. There's organized crime, there's terrorism, there's intelligence agencies from, from other countries, maybe even our own country, who knows. But when I talk about some of the, um, the social engineering tests I've done, think about what I could do if my intentions were truly malicious, particularly with the, the type of miniature technology that's open to us all. I could place small recording devices in a boardroom or on a trading floor. Think of the inf type of information I could get on that, particularly if I was a, a journalist or a competitor. Or maybe I could install a small wireless router somewhere, you know, once I got into your building. And I'll demonstrate uh, on a couple, of, uh, couple more of my uh, tales uh, later how I've uh, managed to get in. So I could install a small wireless router onto your network that I could access from outside the building. I can go next to a coffee shop and do that. Now, some of you may think that this is a bit fanciful or far-fetched, but think again, because it, it has happened. These scenarios are real. They are ones that I've come across, and they are ones I've conducted against organizations as well. And what do they want? Well, the goals of any malicious social engineer can be compared to to the goals of any uh, criminal activity when you think about it. It's knowledge, power, money, control, even bragging rights. And malicious social engineering with the purposes of data theft is like any other crime. It contains a motive and a goal. And the goal is that information, whatever it may be and in whatever form. And think about the value of your, your intellectual, your property. How valuable is it to you? How valuable is it to your organization? And how valuable would it be to a competitor? The second um, sort of case study I want to talk about is um, I was tasked with getting into a, a quite a major telecoms organization. Um, this was in London. Uh, now, they had a few floors on a building, uh, a major building, but they had a reception area. And I knew from um, you know, some of the work I'd done that they had anti-passback turnstiles on every floor. So that was going to be a challenge for me. So rather than try and tailgate, you know, quite often I'd tailgate my way into organizations. A um, cup of coffee, cups, papers under the arm, hold the door for me, please. Yep, I'm fine, and I'm in. You know, and a lot of it is about looking the part. You, you dress how, uh, um, how people dress in their particular work environment, how they behave. Um, but this one I needed to get in. I needed to get in posing as an employee. So the first thing to do is a couple of days of, sort of reconnaissance, surveillance, local coffee shops, bars, um, restaurants, places where people go for lunch. And it's amazing the amount of information you can get just by hanging around in those places. Within a day, day and a half, I think it was, I had more than enough information, um, which I, you know, gave me the confidence to, to go away and do a bit more research. During that time, I was able to, to look at people's uh, ID cards. I meant to bring them with me, but I forgot. I've got a great big stack of them from uh, various organizations. And I was able to make one up just in Photoshop using images I downloaded from the internet for this particular organization that looked pretty damn close to what, uh, what their ID card looked like. The next thing was to um, find some other collateral, if you like, that would um, give people the subconscious um, thought that I actually belonged. So I popped onto eBay. Um, this particular organization um, used to sponsor major sporting events. So I bought a lanyard. It was about five quid, five or six quid off eBay with their logo and the, um, the, the event that they sponsored. So with my uh, branded lanyard and my fake ID, um, now, interestingly, with the, the fake ID, what I, what I did was I went on the, uh, the internet, went on LinkedIn, 
and found the name. It was easy to find names of employees for that particular organization. But I found one who I knew didn't work at this particular office. He worked at uh, a satellite office about 30 miles away. I think it was down in Windsor Way or, or somewhere like that. Anyway, but I set myself a challenge. Um, the, the person I uh, wanted to emulate was Portuguese. Now, obviously, I don't look particularly Portuguese, and I, he had a very sort of Portuguese name. So I thought, let's just see if that will work. So I took his name, used my picture on the ID, and I approached the, uh, the reception area. Now, I said, I, I just went in and I had my, my pass. I said, oh, I'm, I'm here from the, the Windsor office. I'm going to be here for three or four days. Can I have a pass, please? What's your name? Took my name, checked in the database. Yes, I was an employee. Luckily for me, they didn't have photo, uh, employee photographs because obviously I didn't look anything uh, like him. He was about 20 years younger and much better looking for starters. So, but they issued me with a pass. So I didn't have to worry about tricking my way into the building anymore. I had my pass. I could come and go for the rest of the week. And it was quite funny because the, uh, the sponsor, who was, uh, I think he was an IT director at the time, he didn't think I would be able to get into the building um, and after a couple of days. Uh, and once I got in, I just plonked myself down at a hot desk and went for a, a wander around. And I saw him in an office. And as I was walking past, I saw him look up and I, I just went like this and carried on and he did this real cartoon comedy double take it was so funny and he came running out how did you get in so so you know think about some of these uh, these situations as i say these are just um, to try and give you examples so why social engineering well a social engineer is someone who who hacks people like hackers hack computers why as a as a, a you know someone who's got malicious intent should i spend hours, weeks, or even months trying to find vulnerabilities within your systems or brute force my way uh, into any uh, passwords when a phone call with the right pretext and the perfect questions can get me the information I want and the access to the, to the systems. And I can do that in just a few minutes. Because these days, in particular, manipulating people is much easier than trying to defeat layered technical defenses. And, and no technical knowledge is required. I don't come from a technical background, as Jason will um, attest. I don't have any technical knowledge, but I know how to manipulate people. And another aspect of uh, social engineering relies on people's inability to keep up with a culture where that, re well, that relies heavily on information technology, and that technology is changing at such a rate these days. Um, and social engineers rely on the fact that people are not aware of, of the, the, the value of the information that they possess. And because of that, they become careless about, about protecting it. Now, as I said earlier, uh, social engineers using, uh, use a number of psychological tactics on their, on their unsuspecting uh, victims. And successful social engineers are, are confident and in control of, the com of any conversation or interaction that they have with their, with their targets. They simply act like they belong in, in your organization, and their confidence and body posture puts others at, ye uh, puts others at ease. In other words, they, they look like they belong. Um, you know, I've, I've been into many organizations and never been challenged, and I just walk around, and people just think I belong there because of the way I act. And if I can do it, believe me, there are, there are plenty of others out there who are better at it than I am, and they, you wouldn't even notice them. The third case study I want to talk about was, um, was a financial services uh, organization in the city of London. And this was quite a, a major attack. They just wanted to, to see uh, if I could get in and see how much information I could get out. Um, what I did for, get, for that was, again, the coffee shops, having a look at people, how they came in and out, how they dressed, how they acted. And the, the following morning, 10 to 9, I was hanging around outside. I'd switched my phone off, but I was making an imaginary call. Now, this uh, office had a, a security desk on the ground floor, manned by a security guard. And he was responsible for the whole building. And I think there were seven floors, and this organization had three floors on the building. From what I could see, he didn't check people's IDs or, or anything like that as they went in. But through the, the glass-fronted walls, 
it was obvious that the, the, the lifts were access controlled, so there was just a, an access pad on there. So that was my first challenge. So I went in the morning, had everything on, you know, bag over my shoulder, and I was making this pretend call. And I followed about three or four people in, ignored the security guard completely, walked into the lift, and as I was making this call, the person standing next to it swiped his car, and I just went, oh, three, please, like that. And he pressed three, and I was off up. I found myself uh, like a little meeting, glass-walled meeting room, and gave, made that the basis of my operations. I spent five days in there, coming and going. Within about 20 minutes, I'd found a, a document. It was about this thick, and it was um, relating to uh, a merger between two major European household names that everybody would have heard of. And this merger uh, was worth probably just under, I think it was just, I think it was about 470 billion euros. So quite a significant uh, document and quite a significant piece of information which wasn't in the public domain. Imagine if I'd been a competitor or even worse, a journalist, what's the effect on the share price of both of those organizations had I picked that document up with malicious intention. My other problem from then on was I had to get back and forth into the building. I wanted to, as I say, I, I was tasked with seeing if I could get there for five days. So I went back down to see the security guard on the ground floor. I'd taken my jacket off by this time, went to see him with my notebook and a pen, introduced myself and said I was a security auditor. And I needed to, um, you know, I, I showed him a, a fake ID. I can't remember who I was supposed to be with that day, but showed him this fake ID. And I started to ask him some questions and spent about an hour with him. And the thing was, because he was a security guard, he was invisible. Hardly anybody ever spoke to him. A few people said sort of, good morning on the way in, but that was about it. So here was somebody who was taking interest in him and listening to what he had to say. Now, I was able to get information about the guard times, CCTV coverage, how good it was, where the blind spots were. He even told me about the, the secret tunnels that came in from another building um, underneath. So if I needed to get uh, sort of access uh, remotely, I could. Every, basically, every sort of single piece of security information that you would want. Um, from that, you know, I developed quite a good relationship with this guy. I said, I'm just going to pop out for a coffee. Will, will you be able to let me in? Yeah, no problem. So he let me in. I did the same again at lunchtime. Hi there, how are you? A quick chat. I'm just going to get some lunch. Can I get back in? I did that a few times over the, uh, the, the first day. And the next morning, I walked in. I went, morning, Carlos. And he went, oh, morning, Colin. How are you? I said, there you go. And he swiped me into the lift. And that's how I got back and forth into the building every single time. By the Wednesday or Thursday night, I was invited out um, by people in the organization to join them for drinks because I'm a friendly guy and things like that. And the types of information I was able to, um, to glean from them was uh, quite astounding. I had access to all their filing rooms. I had access to all their client details, all their hard copies. I actually took a file, put it in an envelope, went down to on the, uh, one of the floors. They had their own reception area. Who, by, you know, uh, they hadn't challenged me at any point. Um, and I couriered it out to myself using their courier company. So it didn't even cost me anything. And this was all part of the test. Now, towards the end of the week, um, I introduced a, a second consultant who was more technical. And um, we plugged in a, a wireless router and we plugged in a laptop. By then, I'd, you know, I'd been also been into the server room and every, just everywhere within the building. I phoned up the sponsor and I said, this is the situation. Do you want us to carry on? Do you want us to um, sort of try and log in using the, some of the login details that I'd managed to, uh, to get from people. I said, no, no, stop there. The IT director who was a sponsor had a board meeting that Friday and said, uh, we had, uh, we've had an intruder in all week. And there was uproar and what's happened and how did they get in. Explained how I got in and the managing director very sheepishly went, that was me in the lift on the first day. Now, from my point of view and from an awareness point of view, that is the best thing that could ever have happened because that awareness was now going to start from the very top of the organization and hopefully work its way down. Interestingly, did a retest about three or four years later 
on the organization. They'd moved offices by then, but did a retest. Couldn't get anywhere near it. They really took on board the recommendations we'd given and the amount of data that could have gone missing. Um, I, after many attempts, I was able to get in once into the actual building, um, and I was challenged by two or three people, and I couldn't even get past the reception desk. So, you know, good awareness training does work. So how can we combat uh, social engineering? But not just social engineering, but think about all the other threats that you face within your organization. And it's through, basically through good awareness and education. But the traditional method uh, of awareness has been to achieve a, a tick in the box to meet your sort of reg regulatory compliance requirements. But the changing face of the, the digital world and when you think of topics such as bring your own device and, and, and globalization means there's no requirement to, to effect cultural and behavioral change uh, within, you, within your workforce. So how do we do this? Well, this is what we do, um, or this is what I do these days. So first we need to understand the, the brand of the organization. Now that might seem quite an unusual step to take, but when you think of your organization and your organization's brand, that is what sets the tone for the organization, it helps to set the strategy, it's your, your mission, your values, and, and everything that, that you stand for. And what we need to do from, a, from an awareness point is examine these values and behaviors from both a historical and a sort of philosophical perspective. And the, the, the objective is to understand how those key brand attributes have, have evolved over the years and what the organization's vision is for the next five years or so. So the first step to achieving this goal is to assess your culture. Now, I'm sure there's going to be a few IT people in here or a few from a technical background. Now, I bet if you've put in some new infrastructure or, say, a new firewall or maybe a new application, you've conducted a risk assessment. Would I be right? Yeah. When was the last time you risk assessed your people? Because the chances are it probably didn't, uh, probably hasn't happened. Because when you think about it, the majority of breaches happen through human behavior, especially these days. Te technology has moved on uh, so far. And it's vital to examine the, the information security behaviors of, uh, of your employees and any sort of existing and potential threats that arise from the current culture. It is imperative to seek a, a really sort of full understanding of where the key areas of risk exist, and particularly as a, as a, re as a result of the, any sort of knowledge gaps that there might be. Now, this will allow you to segment uh, your employees according to the risk that they present. Uh, so, in, in effect, what you're doing is you're building a, a hierarchy of risk um, down through sort of business units or even down to individual teams, sometimes even down to individual people, depending on who they are. And this will, in turn, will drive a more tailored, effective and structured uh, awareness program. Some of the areas here, you know, I spoke earlier briefly about uh, information value. You know, a lot of employees are not aware of the value of the information. When I talk to, you know, we conduct workshops and counselling sessions uh, and areas like that. And when I talk to them, they often don't know the value of the information or how important it is to the organisation. And so if awareness is to lead to uh, a change in behaviour, it must be recognised that, th that employees are going to um, process this information favourably if, if there's a great narrative uh, um, to tell. So the second step that we, create is, or we do is to create a, a visual language um, that will hopefully win the, the hearts and minds of the audience. Now I spoke about brand earlier and the, the brand of the organisation. And with an understanding of the brand and now an understanding of the culture, you can start to, we can start to explore the conceptual ideas for the look and feel of any sort of programme that we're going to, going to put in place. Uh, and the, the objective is really to arrive at a, a creative direction that flows directly from your brand, but has its own unique and feel that will basically um, identify the, 
the CISO brand as being um, uh, an entity in its own right, but as part of that organization. Because let's be honest, the, the majority of uh, security departments within organizations do not have the best reputation. They are seen as being business inhibitors. You know, computer says no. I've heard that a few times. And what we need to try and do um, in all organizations is to turn that around. We want the security team to be business enablers, not business inhibitors. We want them to di directly engage. But it's got to be a two-way street. It has to be a two-way street. The security team has to be open and receptive to listening to the business as well. So what are the risks and the threats within each of the business units? And that is the only way that you can, you can really sort of start to drive an effective cultural change program. And that's the approach we take. It, it's, it, it really sort of mirrors a, a true marketing function where you understand your demographics and apply the, the necessary tools to, to convey the, the message that you're trying to get across. And the third and, and probably one of the most important uh, phases is measurement. How do you measure awareness? Um, but you've got to, as this, you've got to be able to demonstrate the return on investment because the investment sometimes can be quite significant. And you, it allows your organization, and having that sort of measurement uh, in place, to assess the progress of the campaign and determine how much the security improvement program um, is, has impacted the culture uh, within the business. And it's vital that the, the ongoing measurement um, all the activities are, are, are benchmarked and, and the intelligence um, gathered, you know, the intelligence that you gathered in the first phase during the, your risk assessment phase can be measured against in the future. And this will provide you the evidence base for success, really the, the before and after that determines how effective the information security program or the awareness program is changing the culture of the, your, uh, your organization. So in conclusion, we can see that um, the methods used to attack human weaknesses in our information security systems and our, our organizations are as numerous and diverse as the technological methods used to attack your hardware and your software and your, your apps, etc. So what can be seen from our brief discussion today uh, is that human behavior is a, is a weakness that will always exist. And it can't be patched. That type of weakness or that behavior can't be patched with software downloads. It can't be solved with firewalls or encryption or, or VPNs. Whether, you know, whether you, it, your people are online or not, your, your information is at risk. And the only way to mitigate the risk is through good awareness and, and education right throughout the organization. Uh, and that is just about it for me. So thank you very much. Has anybody got any questions? Any questions? Really? Well, that was easy. Has anyone ever read a book called by Kevin Mignett? Yep. Okay. Questions yes, certainly. Yeah, yeah, sure. How what, sorry? Secure sites. I mean, things like being sorted, being entitled, um, having a security check. So yeah, there's, there's quite a few um, things. The best thing from, uh, from an organizational point of view and the worst thing from a um, social engineer's point of view are turnstiles, and particularly the anti-passback anti turnstiles, because they are a true physical barrier. However, if the, um, if the turnstiles are just at the front of the organization, all I used to do was go around the back and join the smokers. And I'd have be like this. And I'd put the papers under my arm, I'd go and join them for a smoke, and then I'd follow them into the organization at the back. So, you know, there is a way around everything. It just depends how you're... I suppose when you think about your, your network perimeter, think of your physical perimeter as well. Where are the weak points? Where are the points of entry? It's, you're still applying the same basic security principles, whatever you do. Um, and 
the, the key area for me as well is verification. You, we need to train our staff uh, you know, to, to verify who they're talking to, whether it's on the phone or face-to-face. -face. Now, a lot of people are uncomfortable with challenging others in the workspace, but you don't need to challenge them. You can do it, for, you know, in, instead of, who are you? What are you doing here? It's the, the easiest way is, can I help you? Who do you need to talk to? You're friendly, you're approachable. Um, but that's, those are the little tips and tricks that you need to, uh, you know, to help train your, your organization uh, and train your people within the organization. Because it is, uh, you know, I, I keep talking about culture and, and behavior. And, you know, to effect cultural change, it's, it's a long process. It's not something that can be done in, in three months or six months or whatever. You're talking probably three years. But I like to think of it as, you want to embed those uh, security behaviors really into the, almost the, the subconscious. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard the, uh, the term, it's, uh, was it um, unconscious competence, I think it is. There's about four main areas. And the, the, the best analogy I can give you is, think about when you were learning to drive. The very first time you got in a car, you had all these three pedals, you had a gear stick. When you were thinking about when you wanted to change gear, you thought, I've got to put my left foot down, take my right foot off, et cetera, change the gear, left my you know, left foot up again. Now, I bet all you drivers, you don't even think about changing gear. It's the same with behaviors and security behaviors in the organization. You, you want them to do their little checks that become second nature. And you know, it creates this, this culture of, of unconscious competence. I hope that makes sense. I know I can ramble on at times, but... Uh, was that okay? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. In an organization where it's sufficiently large that not every recognized employee of a staff, mm -hmm. um, and where, for example, we have security cards and access cards which don't have any identifying features, so they're easily copied. Yep. It's, yeah, I mean, I've worked in organizations like that, and there are people coming and going, but you tend to get to know the people after a while. And if a straight, you know, even if it is quite a, a diverse um, sort of move or mobile workforce, you, you tend to get to know uh, the, the regulars, as it were. And, but you also, for me, the, um, the ones who are strangers uh, stand out. But again, it's down to your perimeter. So... And you know, not al yeah, and uh, not allowing people in. So if you've got turnstiles and somebody tries to tailgate you through, oh sorry, no, you, you need to go back to security or get you sorted out or get a temporary pass. Don't hold the doors open. You know, it's all those uh, all those sorts of things. So am I? Uh, no, no, no. I'm just going on. To, to, to switch over on the screen. All right. Any more questions for Colin? Colin will be around after joining the coffee as well. So uh, please feel free to, to put him to one side. Thank you, Colin. All right. Thank you.